Welcome everybody. Really lovely to be with you for this free webinar on kind productivity. Um, my intention with this is to create some space for us all to think about how kindness and productivity interact. I want to tell you a bit about uh, my work around kindful leadership. Uh, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, uh, maybe a little bit less than that, and then we are going to open it up for Q&A for about 15 minutes. And then following that, if you can stay around, I'm going to do a little bit of the normal after dark thing that I do. So just hanging around to answer more questions. We had about 300 people sign up for this. We've got about 100 in the room right now. More on LinkedIn, uh, where it's streaming live as well. Everyone from Calgary in Canada to Botswana to Birmingham to everywhere in between. So really lovely to have you all here. And um, I'm just, yeah, just really thrilled that so many people have made space in your busy diaries to think about kindness and how it interacts with productivity. So um, most of you will know me. Um, I'm probably best known for my book, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. Um, I'm also the founder of um, the host of this webinar, Think Productive, um, which is a company that helps people to do their best work all around the world. And we have a whole bunch of different um, public workshops, leadership and management programs, and then also a whole bunch of in-house workshops. So if you're interested in um, someone from our team coming to help your company, um, then do check out thinkproductive.com. And um, one of Think Productive's uh, corporate values is trust and kindness are our rocket fuel. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about how Think Productive works as we go through this session. And um, I know that some people, when you're on sessions like this, you quite like to stalk the host. So if you go to grahamalcott.com forward slash links, that's like everything I'm doing now and all the kind of links of key stuff. So um, if you want to just find out a bit more about me, uh, then graymalcott.com forward slash links is a great place to start um, and go and check out my books. OK, so um, my book, Productivity Ninja, has nine characteristics of the ninja. And the final one and my favorite one is human, not superhero. And what this basically says is if you do all of the good stuff that's in Productivity Ninja, then everyone else in the office will look at you like you're some kind of superhero. But the truth is a ninja is just a human being with good tools and good skills and a good mindset. And the other part about human, not superhero is that humans have limits. And also a phrase that I've been using a lot over the years, humans are weird. Um, so we're all different, we're all a bit weird. We all come at everything that we do with a whole bunch of foibles and failures and biases and all kinds of things attached to that. And so this for me is where I think kindness becomes a really important topic. How we deal with the humans that we work with, how we allow people to be human at work, how we interact on that really human level, um, for me is actually just the game of work, you know, and getting that right, as I'm sure many of you know, is the thing that really kind of unlocks creativity, productivity, and lots more, which we will come back to. We'll come back to a bit of the science of that as well. But I want to just talk about something which I've been um, thinking about a lot and writing about. I've got a whole book um, coming out on this topic, um, and I'm calling this the ruthlessness fallacy. It's the idea that um, the people who are the most willing to be bastards in the way that they work are the people who succeed. We are fed this narrative so much more than you think. So if you think about your Instagram, if you if you follow any stuff on Instagram around business, or look at LinkedIn. So much of it is stories of Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Donald Trump. And, you know, there's this whole kind of media archetype that is played out, which is the kind of, you know, ruthless, greedy, capitalist, uh, you know, kind of leader is the one who succeeds. Think about how Dragon's Den is shot. Think about what they encourage the apprentice candidates to say. You know, Mr. Burns in The Simpsons. All of these uh, people are just part of this archetype of the kind of ruthless business bastard. And I think this whole notion is, is just a complete fallacy. It's it so widely spread and so widely shared because it's really interesting. And we all like to maybe just engage that uh, little part of our brain that's curious about what would it be like if I was just much less well behaved um, than I actually uh, you know, am. And you know, if I got rid of all the rules that actually make uh, you know, make me kinder and make life better for everybody around me. Um, so there's a kind of curiosity to that. 
also lots of the people that we talk about here are outliers. We do not hear about the people who were really ruthless and behave really badly and then failed. Um, you know, Elizabeth Holmes is a really good case study for that, is that like people haven't talked so much about how the culture of her organization was really bad. They kind of then say, well, she was the one who was misleading. But actually, I think so many of the, these leaders actually just don't succeed anyway. Um, so I think there's a whole uh, sort of misplaced interest in the idea of the business baddie, the business bastard. And we don't spend enough time really thinking about the people who do this stuff really well. I know there are a few people on this call who I know who are um, actually really kind and brilliant leaders and do the people stuff superbly well. So we already have a, a massive resource in this space online right now. Um, I really hope that comes through in some of your questions, by the way. Um, but I do think there's um, you know, this, this idea of the, the business bastard needs to be challenged and changed. And we need new heroes. Um, so Nick Jenkins on the bottom left there, he's one of the dragons on Dragon's Den. He didn't last very long. And I actually interviewed him for my podcast a while ago. And I talked to him about this. And it basically turned out that he had spent his whole career trying to just be helpful to people. So if you remember Nick Jenkins on Dragon's Den, he was basically giving people really helpful free advice the whole time, even when he wasn't going to invest in them. And he was just thoroughly decent. Doesn't make good telly. Um, Mary Portis has talked a lot about the idea of the kindness economy um, Tony Shea on the top right there, um, who is no longer with us, but as the CEO of Zappos really created this culture about, um, you know, being kind and helping people to be happy, um, just a very inspiring um, sort of philosophy of the way that he worked. And when you think about those business bastards, the Steve Jobs, you know, would you want to work for someone like that versus would you go and want to work every day for Oprah? I mean, how amazing would that be with the level of you know, empathy off the scale that Oprah has, it would just be an incredible experience. You'd learn so much about people and yourself um, just by being in the room with Oprah for sort of any period of time. Um, John Timpson is one of my favorite um, heroes, the new kindness heroes. Um, so if you don't know um, the the working culture of, of Timpson's, Timpson's the, the shoe and key shop, never quite worked out why keys and shoes go together, but that's a whole nother story, a whole nother webinar for another day. Um, but he has just really built an incredible culture centered around kindness. So he encourages his staff to share their kindness stories. He empowers them to uh, make kind decisions in customer service elements of the role. So if someone just needs stuff fixing and they can't pay for it, for it, if someone needs their suit dry clean and they can't pay for it, he will just say, just go and be kind, be kind to customers and you'll see the stories spread from that. And um, they also own holiday homes to give their employees free holidays. Uh, if your pet dies, you get a pet bereavement day. Uh, you get the day off school when your kid starts. You get the day off work when your kid starts school so that you can actually be present for your kids on the day that they start a new school. So all these simple little things um, just build up this culture of, of kindness that, that Timpsons has. Um, and if you want to just um, if you just Google, um, you know, Timpsons and kindness, there's a whole section on their website which will tell stories and um, just hugely inspiring What's also interesting is so many of the things on there are just really simple. They don't take much time. They don't take much money, but they really give a sense of belonging to the employees. Uh, we can't talk about uh, approaches to kindness without talking about Jacinda Ardern, who made it a big um, sort of philosophy and part of her leadership style. Um, what I would say on that is if you think about the approach that she took around COVID versus how did all the other leaders that we're familiar with, and we won't really need to mention any names, um, how did those people deal with COVID? They they basically had this approach of, it'll all be fine. They didn't tell people what they really needed to hear. Uh, whereas Jacinda Ardern really kind of spoke the truth, but she did it with a really radical kindness and empathy. So she said, this is going to be tough. We're capable. We will get through this. And, you know, and she was there for people too. So she did Facebook Lives and all kinds of things. Um, and as a consequence of her approach, which was very tough, but also had that loving kindness aspect to it as well. Um, obviously much lower uh, mortality rate in, um, in New Zealand than most of the other uh, sort of developed nations. So um, just a hugely inspiring figure when it comes to thinking about kindness and leadership. And um, this is something that I think productive we've been thinking about and utilizing and just making, uh, articulating as part of our culture for a long time. So I mentioned before, one of our uh, one of our corporate values is trust and kindness are a rocket fuel. And what we really mean by that is when you have trust, 
you get to a point where you eliminate due diligence. You don't need to be micromanaging. You don't need to be CCing everyone in on the emails. It's much easier to give people that space to be themselves, to be human when you have that level of trust. And I think it kind of goes a little bit further for me. So here's the kind of central thesis, thesis of the upcoming book, which is that when you have kindness and empathy, then you build trust within teams. And by building trust, you get to a place of psychological safety. Um, psychological safety is one of those terms that has kind of emanated from the HR room into a bit more of a kind of mainstream um, sort of usage um, in the last few years. But I think there's something really, really powerful about, um, you know, viewing your role as a leader as essentially how can I build psychological safety um, for the people around me? And from psychological safety, we're able to just, just do incredible things and unlock incredible things. So once you have this sense of psychological safety in a team, if someone spots something which could really get in the way, if someone spots something that could be a really difficult um, you know, thing that uh, you know, could derail the whole endeavor, then with psychological safety, they feel trusted and able to express that and say, hey, spanner in the works, but here's the thing. When you have psychological safety, if someone has a really kind of out there, slightly odd idea, but they just have an inkling that it might work, they will put their hand up and say, hey, just an idea, but, and then you get an, an incredible creative thinking off the back of that. Um, and lots of science behind the idea that when teams feel psychologically safe, uh, people stay longer. You know, they, there's that sort of classic um, phrase of people join organizations, people leave bosses. When people have that sense of, of safety they, and feel like they belong, they stay longer, they're happier, and they just perform better. Um, so I really see, you know, my role as a leader and when I'm talking to organizations that, you know, lots of, lots of our roles as leaders ultimately is about how can I create safety? How can I create that sense of psychological safety within my team? Um, and, you know, as um, Jason Freed from 37 Signals often talks about, um, his job is to get out of the way. You know, once you have that safety, uh, that you know, once you create that safety, you're able to kind of get out of the way and just let people be human, be themselves, do stuff in the way that is most comfortable for them, and then you get better results. Right, we can't talk about kindness without um, really kind of tackling this uh, slightly difficult thing. I think a lot of people struggle with the idea of kindness, and I'd love to hear in the questions about um, how you you know, if you if you believe in kindness, do you struggle when you try and talk to your team, your managers, other people about this notion of kindness or, or being a kind leader? And I think often when people struggle to sell kindness, it's because the person on the other end of that is mistaking being kind for being nice. And I think they're actually very, very different things. So it's a really important distinction to make. Um, so for me, nice is when you say what people want to hear. And kind is when you say what people need to hear. Very, very different. So kindness isn't always the easy option. Kindness has an element of truth to it. So my colleague, Chris Kisley, calls it truth and grace. You know, it's the salted caramel, caramel, it's the salt and the sweetness. Truth and grace is really a really good definition of kindness. But that takes some bravery. It takes some skill. It takes this idea of radical candor to really... Um, you know, kind of deliver the stuff that might be really difficult, but really gets you to where you need to go. Um, so think about, you know, just think about a time when uh, someone was giving a presentation either to a client or to the team, and then they finish the presentation and you know it wasn't very good. And afterwards they go, yeah, so how did I do? How was it? And the easy option is, you know, the nice option is to say, yeah, yeah it was good. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sort of, you know, smile. The kind option is to be a little bit brave to put yourself out there and to say, yeah, not for right now, but I've got some thoughts. Let's let's go through that another time and, you know, and just actually give people the truth that will help them grow. And that can be really difficult sometimes. But, you know, truth and grace is really about being for the other person and being committed to the success, the growth, you know, and, of, of that other person, rather than just doing the thing that's the kind of easy thing to say or do in that moment, just to kind of get out of the situation. And um, so just a few examples of nice versus kind. Um, so um, it's nice when you're not really telling the truth, but you're just kind of, you know, skirting around it just because you don't want to hurt someone's feelings um, or that kind of sense of the go along to get along in meetings. Like, is everyone OK with this? Yeah. 
right? And then you walk out the room and you bitch about them afterwards, you know? Uh, whereas kind is finding a way to tell the truth in a brave way that's for the other person. It's, you know, when you need to disagree, disagreeing and doing that respectively, you know, respectfully, um, but also just standing up for the things that you really value and, and really kind of, um, you know, like acknowledging that we don't all have to agree on everything the whole time, but we can really respectfully have dialogue and kind of work out probably the best truth is somewhere between where I am and where you, and where you are. Um, seven traits of um, kindful leaders. So I think leaders have to have vision and values um, and really clearly articulated values. And I've worked with some some leaders um, over the years who were really good at kind of using personal mantras uh, in order to really articulate their values. Um, one of them particularly who, um, Lizzie, who's on the call will know, um, Fiona Dorr, um, she used to have this phrase, uh, which was, I don't care if you screw up as long as you own up and clear up. And, you know, how much psychological safety is held within that really kind of short little mantra and just kind of everyone knew the mantra um, everyone kind of repeated it. And, um, you know, just for me, that's just so clear in kind of articulating what you expect from people. Um, a mantra that I've used a lot over the years is like this idea of people first, work second, always, which is about saying there will always be those moments where however committed you are to your team, however committed you are to your work, if your house is on fire, if your relationship is breaking down, if someone has died, whatever those things are that are going on, they're just going to be more important. And so, you know, we've, we're used to this idea, this idea that's been very pervasive for a long time, that being professional is about just, you know, powering on through those moments. And, you know, sometimes uh, people want to work through difficult times and it's a good distraction. But, you know, I think often we need to be much more caring in the way that we say, you know, drop everything, go do your thing, go and sort everything out. And when you come back, you'll be in a much better place to really pick things up. Um, so people first work second always is just this little mantra that over the years I've really um, sort of honed and developed within our team. And people know that, um, you know, there's a couple of little nuances within that phrase. So one of them is that it's always somebody's always. So to be on the lookout for who is struggling right now and maybe not telling you. Um, and so fight proactively looking for that stuff, creating the space of that stuff. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it's always somebody's always. And so when when it's you, um, you need to drop everything and just let go. And that's OK. And then when it's somebody else and you have the pr privilege of it not being you that day, then it's your job to step up and make sure that the team is is kind of carrying whoever that person is who's away. So. That's just been one of those phrases that I've really used over the years. And, you know, we started out as it, as it you know, with this being a kind of um, approach to emergencies. And actually, it's it's come to mean a whole lot more. So it really means kind of honoring, um, you know, the, the, the personality, the difference, the diversity of teams, as well as kind of how we treat the humanity of people when when times are a little bit rough. Um, Self-awareness, just being aware of your own weaknesses, biases, doing that inner work really really important and i think you know that also sets the stage if you're curious about your own deficiencies it makes it easier for you to be curious about what other people might need to do to grow as well uh, being a trust builder so someone who is just constantly looking out for how can we have um, healthy conflict how can we build autonomy how can we build personal development and growth within people um, and a cultural architect. So this is a term I got from um, Sven Goran Eriksson when he was the England manager. And he, ident he identified very early on that he was with a whole bunch of people who didn't necessarily have that kind of winning mentality with it within when they went to the England team. But then he had this, this guy, David Beckham, who he made the captain, he made the focal point. And Beckham basically built the, the sort of culture within that England team. And um, it's kind of recognizing you can't do it all yourself. Who are your cultural architects? Who are the people that share the same kind of values as you, the same kind of approach as you. And, you know, through working with them and for, through them being on the same page as you, you can actually get to somewhere much more powerfully and quickly than just trying to do everything yourself. And then humility. So being being the spotlight, not the star, um, and really kind of looking out for how can I put other people on a pedestal? It's not all about me. Um, taking ownership when stuff goes wrong, but also giving credit when stuff goes well. And then I wanted to just give you um, just five very quick fire practical um, ways. And I'd love you to share in the chat your own 
uh, your own kind of quick fire kindness um, ideas. What do you use that works really well? Are there little mantras, um, little acts that you do, things that are just, you know, things that you get a little bit of a buzz out when it comes to kindness? Um, but just here's a couple of mine. Um, so just back onto that idea of human, not superhero, and kind of thinking about the humanity of people. Um, so in emails, and I use this one a lot. Um, so if someone's sending you that email, where it's like, oh, no, I've screwed this thing up. I'm so sorry. Is actually to sort of turn that around and say, you screwed up. How amazing is it that this is the first time this has screwed up in five years? And it means you're human after all, which is great news. And just to kind of turn that around um, and just, you know, create out of that a moment where you can really build someone's self-esteem at a point when things aren't good. Um, we start a lot of our meetings um, with versions of the question, how are you feeling today? Where are you in this moment right now? Because um, we think that's a really important way to just embrace that humanness. Um, you know, no one, someone's going to not really be listening if they're having a terrible day. Um, and obviously, if it's a really terrible day, then that question can unlock the other question, which is like, are you in the right place right now? Like, do you need to be somewhere else doing something else? Um, and then in general, so we have a whole policy around um, duvet days. Um, we work a four day week, which we've done for a long time. There's a whole bunch of sort of policy stuff that we do that speaks to the idea that as human beings, we have limitations. And um, so the studies on the law of diminishing returns on productivity um, for humans in knowledge work in thinking jobs um, is more like 30 hours a week than 40 hours a week. Um, so we kind of also, al almost need to think about that um, in sort of re-engineering the nine to five away from you know the current nine to five Monday to Friday system, which was very much set up for the kind of industrial assembly line kind of era. Um, people first work second always. So people just focus better when the home life is OK. Um, so just, you know, also just recognizing that all of those moments when life is difficult for somebody are also just massive opportunities to build trust. And also just recognizing this idea of it's always someone's always, um, um, you know, when it's not yours, you pitch in and when it's not yours, you let go. Um, creating the space for deeper listening. I'm going to talk about this at the end as well. I think. Um, our job as leaders often is to create the spaces and the vessels um, into which sort of tension or discomfort can go, right? So um, if people just hold on to tension and discomfort for too long, then at some point it spills over and there's like the tiniest thing goes wrong and someone just erupts and reacts, um, you know, or a massive conflict uh, sort of emerges out of next to nothing. So it's really important to have that tension uh, go somewhere and you know sometimes as leaders our job is to create the the containers the vessels where that can go and um, so I, I see one-to-ones and you know annual appraisals and those kinds of conversations as really useful places um, for that to happen where it's like we're not talking about the work I'm not criticizing a thing you've just done we are just talking in general terms about your performance your happiness where are you up to your commitment all of those kind of things that taking a step back is a really useful thing. Um, but also in meetings. So um, one question that we ask a lot at Think Productive, in fact, it's part of our daily huddle that happens every morning, is this idea of where are you stuck? Really, really simple, four words. But the power of that little phrase, um, which I've been using for years, I got that originally from um, a book called uh, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish. Um, but the idea of that phrase, where are you stuck? is so powerful because what it allows is, is that we reset the truth that you will be stuck. There'll be things you're gonna be stuck on. That's okay, that is a natural part of work. But so much of the way that we work is about putting up fronts. No, I'm, I'm, I'm cool, like I've got everything under control. So just having that as a little phrase um, really allows us to just put in on the truth that you probably are stuck. You probably do need some help. And someone's very quick idea in that moment, if you, can get over your own ego enough to be able to share that and be that little bit vulnerable in order to share, yeah, I'm stuck, I'm really struggling. You can get that help very, very quickly and, and move stuff, stuff forward. Um, the last one there, um, just in terms of um, thinking about diversity of thought in the room, um, thinking about the, the different levels of seniority in a room. Um, so in uh, How to Fix Meetings, my book with Hayley Watts, we talk about um, the hippo, um, the highest paid person's opinion. Um, and so if you've got power dynamics within a room, and if you think you don't have power dynamics in a room, you, it probably means that you're quite senior and you just haven't thought about that for a long time. Um, but there will be power dynamics in the room 
where if you get people to write their ideas down or to vote on what they think the number should be first and do that blindly without discussion and then you discuss then you'll get a much more diverse range than if someone quite senior at the beginning says hey i think this and then everybody just kind of fills in and basically copies that or adjusts their um, answers to kind of fit in with that um, and then meetings, I'm very influenced by um, the work of Nancy Klein, um, her, her whole sort of theory around the thinking environment. Um, so a couple of things you can do, which I think are really kind in meetings. Um, one is just to start with an opening round, go around the room. How are you today? And one thing that's going well, just share that with, with the room. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, um, asking questions like, what did you appreciate about this meeting? What are you looking forward to next week? So ending with positive reality, ending with humanity, uh, but the thing about the beginning part is once you've all gone around and said something, it's broken the seal. So no one feels like they're too nervous to talk. Everyone's talked on a subject that they know um, very early on in the meeting. And that, again, just opens up that kind of quality of thinking to happen. And I won't read all these out, but um, email is one of the simplest quick fire little ways. Slack and Teams and, and those tools are, are, are the same, too. Um, they're the simplest little ways, just in moments, you can fire off um, little messages of kindness that will make somebody's day and are very cheap. They don't take very long to do. Um, and you can really pep someone up and make someone's day. So just a few little ideas there of uh, how can you do that on email. And I'm just going to challenge you for the rest of this afternoon. Um, if you're somewhere near your email inbox, What's the kindest email you can send today? And what's what's stopping you, what's holding you back from sending that? So just send it. Um, it could be two lines, it could be an essay, uh, but just what can you do on email this afternoon to just you know spread some kindness? Um, and kindness is infectious. There's a whole bunch more of this, um, which I could talk about for hours and hours, but the science of this is pretty clear that the, the number of wins you get just from one bit of kindness. So you are um, the person who is kind, um, they have a little dopamine hit. The person who receives it has a dopamine hit and an oxytocin hit. If you just, there's loads of science where, where if you just view other people being kind, if you just see it, if you just witness it, then you get that little hit of, of connect, connection and oxytocin as well. So there's just so many ben benefits to being kind. And my final challenge to you, so um, there's, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. So put your questions in the chat, put your questions in the Q&A. We're coming to you um, just in a couple of moments. Um, so there's, if anyone's been to Naples, you can share this in the chat as well. Um, there's a thing that they do there called uh, Cafe Sospeso, which has kind of spread to other places too, but began in 1960s Naples. And it basically just means the suspended coffee. So it's a really simple idea where you pay it forward, you buy your coffee, and then you buy one more, and then the person behind the counter puts that receipt for that one more that you just bought into the jar. And then when someone else is just out of change or doesn't have the money or is in a rush or whatever it needs to be, they can just say, hey, I need a coffee. I'm just gonna get one from the cafe sospeso jar. I'm just gonna take one from the jar. That's mine for the day. So it's just a really simple way to play it forward. And um, the reason I love this as just a little metaphor for our job as leaders and thinking about how we can be kind as leaders is that actually when you think about what has what has the uh, person who owns the coffee shop actually given up? Um, all they did is once they had one idea to get a jar and write cafe suspense on it, right? And so what happens every day? The magic of kindness flows. People put stuff in the jar. Everyone witnesses that. The whole shop witnesses it. People take stuff out of the jar. Everyone witnesses that. People feel great. People feel you know, more aligned to organizations that they think of as kinder. So this, this huge benefit of ongoing kindness came from one person either buying or finding a jar, writing a couple of words on it and leaving it on the counter, and that's it. So I, I'm just a real big believer in this idea that we don't have to, it's, you know, it's not about us being kind all the time, every day. That will get us so far, and that's great. But what it's really about is how can we be that vessel for kindness? How can we be kindful where we're we're looking around for creating the opportunities where other people can be kind to each other, but we're creating that culture that's outside of us, that's more of us, that has this knock-on effect much bigger than us. So that's really why I love that idea of Cafe Sospezo, because you know, we can think of ourselves as kind, but what changes the culture is when we when we create and we look through that lens of how can other people be kind, how can we create those moments where other people find it much easier to be kind. 
Okay, so put your questions in the chat. We're going to be um, coming to you in a second. Um, so um, just a couple of quick things I want to say before we move into Q&A. One is... Um, Many of you are here because you're members of my little Rev Up for the Week community. So this is um, a free email that I send every Sunday. Um, and the idea is it's a positive or productive idea for the week ahead. It goes out every Sunday at 4.05 p.m. Um, it actually screwed up this week. So I realized it hadn't gone out at like 8 o'clock and it went out a bit later. But generally, it's 4.05 every Sunday. It's free. And if you just go to grahamalcott.com, uh, you, can, uh, you can sign up for that. So that's a really great place to know when i'm doing more stuff like this and also within that email i'm just i'm just giving out just kind of interesting ideas sharing perspectives whether it's ai or productivity or kindness or whatever it might be that week and um, so if you want to be part of that just go to graymalcott.com fill in the little form and that's you signed up forever uh, until you decide to unsubscribe if you want to do that um i won't take it personally a um, couple of webinars we've got coming up um tomorrow actually um my Colleague Elena is doing um, a webinar all about how to use improv to help you get comfortable with imperfections and get comfortable with making mistakes. Um, I've done a bit of improv myself and really see the benefits, you know, in just terms of changing the way you think. Um, and then 6th of July, um, loving your inner presenter. So if presenting is one of those things that really scares you. So you can sign up to those at uh, thinkproductive.com and just click on the try us for free bar. Uh, and free webinars, you'll see it all there. And we've got a couple of um, big things coming up. These are paid ones. Um, so a public workshop on how to be a productivity ninja, whole day. Basically, if you've read how to be a productivity ninja, but you still feel like you haven't implemented it, then this is the place to go, um, how to be a productivity ninja, full day. And um, that's on the 8th of August. Um, apparently, we uh, our metrics are pretty good for selling tickets in August. And I think it's because those of you who are still working and still around, the office is quiet and it's kind of easy. Um, and then we're running these um, sort of three levels. So this is um, the middle level of our leadership and management programs, the High Performance Manager, which starts in September. Um, so if you want to be part of a community to really look at your management skills and how to drive performance, um, that's a great place to go. Um, and then also I'm running with my colleague, Chris Kisley, um, we're running um, a, a six week program um, called Kind for Leadership. So if you've like some of the ideas and you want to be part of a small community with its own whatsapp group kind of secretly plotting more kindness in your organization um then come and sign up for kind for, kind for leadership so if you go to event eventbrite um, and emily will put the uh, link in the chat in a second um so if you go to eventbrite and there's a little code on there if you just type in um, webinar as your code you'll get 10 percent off um so yeah there's still some tickets i would love your company um, it starts on the 21st of June, and that's some of the stuff that we're going to be uh, talking about through those weeks. So we'll talk about some of the science of kindness. We're going to help you to slow down and be kinder to yourself. I think being uh, kind to yourself is where it all starts. Um, then we'll talk a bit about kind of some of the, the leadership ideas around just how to be a better leader. And then we're going to look at things like listening, feedback and empathy, humility, and then how to build that in that sense of culture and the ripple effects that we just talked about. So if that sounds interesting, um, it's UK time um, evenings on a Wednesday, so 7.15 to 9.15, um, also designed in that way so that it's kind of afternoon time in the US. Um, Chris Kisley, my colleague, is in the US. Um, so um, yeah, it'll be a, a group of about 35 um, and there's still some tickets. So if that is of interest, um, just head to Eventbrite and just type in kind for leadership. You'll find us there. OK, we've got two questions in the Q&A and lots of things in the chat. So I'm going to open it up for some questions. Um, we're going to uh, formally close in uh, 10 minutes at quarter two. And then I'm going to just stay on and do more Q&A. So uh, that's the after dark bit uh, will be from 2.45 till 3. So if you can stay on um, for the whole uh, rest of the hour, then please do. Um, but yeah, let's uh, head to some questions. Uh, so an anonymous attendee <laughs> has uh, uh, put the question, I think others can be suspicious of kindness and wonder if there is an ulterior motive. What are your thoughts? So here's the thing about ulterior motives and kindness. I think there's sort of two aspects to this. One is um, from the point of view of someone who just wants there to be more kindness in the world, I don't actually mind that much if you have occasionally a bit of an ulterior motive for your kindness. Um, as long as 
you put the kindness out there. We shouldn't worry too much about the, you know, the the sort of the central, um, you know, authenticity of kindness. But here's the flip side of that, which is, I think if you if that's what you're doing, if you are putting kindness out into the world for the sole reason of getting something back, if you're giving to get, I think people just will see through that very quickly. I think humans are not stupid. They notice patterns. They've seen that before. And so I think coming from a place of actual love, actual heart, um, is there's just no substitute for that. I think you have to start from that place. Um, so I think there can sometimes be times where people do uh, commit kind acts uh, with an ulterior motive. Um, and I think that does actually put more kindness out in the world. But I think, you know, if you're doing that as your strategy or making it a strategy, um, I think you'll get found out re really quite quickly there. Uh, how can you get over the feeling of always giving and never receiving any kindness? Um, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a challenging little answer to that. Um, kindness starts with you. So whoever has written that's an anonymous attendee, um, I'm going to invite you to be truly kind to yourself, not just for today, but for the rest of this week, and then see how that makes you feel. So, and I mean that because I think so many of us have, and I'll include myself in this, we feel guilty about self-kindness. We feel a bit icky about it. It can feel selfish. There's all kinds of words that come up. And when I've done the Kindful Leadership Program before, one of the things that really uh, people find very challenging is their own identity around kindness. So uh, I'm going to challenge you with that question to start with you. Uh, to practice some self-kindness and what you'll find is that will inspire you to uh, to be kinder to others but yeah there is this talk about compassion fatigue isn't there and I think um, if you're feeling compassion fatigue um, don't stop being kind just direct that kindness inwards and to yourself um, and then the messages you know emanate the narratives come back out I'm a big fan of doing kind emails etc but uh, sometimes worry in case it comes across as a bit fake or annoying have you ever felt the same? Yes, all the time. So I think, again, this is coming back to the question of um, where's like where's the authenticity here? Like, is there a real sense of heart behind this? Am I coming from a really good place with that? And so, um, yeah, like I think then it's not fake. And I think, um, you know, ultimately the the kind of measure of kindness for me is whether the impact that is received matches your intent. You know, that's really what, what you're aiming for the whole time. Um, but like, you know, occasionally, if there might be something where you have a really, uh, you know, you, you you have a real heart to share something and then it comes across as a little bit fake, you are going to get that wrong. Like it will it will go wrong sometimes. So I do think it's worth trying to get over that sort of sense of fear um, and just do the best that you can. We, we're all human. We can only all do the best that we can. Um, but I think trying to get over that barrier um that makes you think oh that means I shouldn't put my kindness out into the world I think we need to try and get over that and just step into how can we be more be more kind does kind for leadership require some level of accountability and commitment from those around us yes it's a really interesting question Aravinda is because I kind of built my career off the back of being the productivity guy and the interesting thing about that is it means I can never reply late to an email ever um, and then it feels like moving into this space of writing a book um, around kindness. It's like everything I do, I'm on the hook for now, right? Like I'm, I'm going to be really um, accountable. And you know what? I, I thought about that for quite a few months as I was writing the book. And as I was writing the book, I realized what a great thing to be on the hook for. What an amazing thing to be accountable for. So um, I want high standards. I want to be kind all the time. And so I'm going to take a little bit of that flack when I miss the mark because I'm setting myself a high standard and that's okay. So that's how I think about that one. What are your thoughts on kind? Oh, great question. What are your thoughts on kindness being mistaken for weakness or that you are a walkover, especially in an industry that is quite aggressive and confrontational? That is such a good question. I think for me, this comes back to when we mistake kindness for weakness, it's often because we're getting that confusion between kind and nice. So remember the difference between kind and nice is that with kind, it's the truth with grace, right? So you're not shying away from the truth when you're kind. 
you are often shying away from the truth when you're just being nice. It's the go along to get along. Um, so for me, I think once you can establish that, you know, that that sort of quiet, um, you know, that sort of quiet assertion of something, that quiet commitment to the truth, um, once you can establish that you are serious about that and there are boundaries and that just because you're kind, it doesn't mean you don't have boundaries. I think that um, really kind of lessens that idea of, um, you know, being kind means that you're weak or you're some kind of walkover. Uh, kindness can be a superpower, but how would but how would be distorted when under stress? Would it work against you? Um, so if I understand your question there, so. Um, I think often people see kindness as a bit of a sort of nice to have luxury thing. And then when you get stressed and you're busy, then kindness kind of goes out the window. And it kind of reminds me of that um, Buddhist phrase, which says you should meditate for half an hour a day, except when you're busy, then you should meditate for an hour a day. And I think sometimes, you know, the biggest, for me, the biggest cause of accidental unkindness is busyness. And so once we recognize the truth, then it's up to us to create some of that space, right? It's up to us to create that little bit of space in our day, that little bit of space in a meeting, that little bit of space at the top of an email, whatever it might be, to, to put in the kindness and, and not lose it when you're stressed and busy. Um, so I think, yeah, it can, it can kind of work against you. And it is, you know, kindness and building trust and having empathy for people, um, they take time. They take time. And what you need to do is see that time that you're investing as an investment in the trust and psychological safety that just pays back a hundredfold. So don't see it as a free thing. See kindness as an investment thing um, and make sure there's always space for it. Uh, Tess, I think kindness can be harder in very formal work environments, e.g., disciplinaries, redundancies, et cetera, uh, where ironically, uh, it's probably the most important. Any tips for kindness in formal environments? So a couple of things I'm going to say about this. I think it's such a good question, Tess. Um, so one is, um, from experience, uh, you can be, you can make redundancies in a really kind way. And there are, you know, I've I've done that. We've been in the room where we've all cried together, right? And like, we didn't want to make somebody redundant and it happened um and i think those things can also be they'll, they'll, they'll hit the headlines when someone is maybe redundant by text message and all those kind of things um so i think it's uh we shouldn't discount the fact that kindness can exist in those difficult spaces disciplinaries redundancies i've had lots of emails since i started talking about kindness with people saying stuff like hey i had a really difficult one-to-one -one with somebody or a disciplinary and I was really honest and I gave the truth but I gave it with grace that idea of truth and grace and we've come out of it you know really it was really challenging but we've come out of it in a really good way so I think um when when we start with the frame of it's possible then we we go in that direction and the second thing I'm going to say this has happened a couple of times recently I've been working with people who in order to be how do I phrase this? In order to be kind and flexible and people first, work second, always in the way they're sort of managing their team, they've basically had to make exceptions to or circumvent the HR policies, right? So it's like this person's supposed to be on sick leave or this person's supposed to be on a bereavement thing, but like I'm not in the moment that they're in right now going to make them fill in forms and do this, that, the other. And so I'm going to deliberately break the rules a little bit. And I think that if if you're coming at a place where you are genuinely for the other person in that moment and what you're what you have an eye on is keeping the trust of that person being for them seeing them through a difficult point and you know the payback of that right which is that they're going to come back so happy that you did that so grateful that you did that and they're going to be committed to the work they're doing um then i actually think that's okay um which I'm sure it would get me into trouble in certain organizations if I uh, said that uh, in a Q&A keynote, but like that's not today. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've done that where I've kind of broken policies and rules and stuff to be more human centric. And I think I just think it's uh, one of those things until we until someone, uh, maybe someone on this webinar right now wants to be the HR person who makes it their life's work to create kinder policies, then maybe we just kind of need to do a little bit of that. Um, so just um, a quick 
reminder before we do the official uh, close, and then we will are going to stick on for a bit of um, af after dark. Um, so yeah, if you want to come to the Kindful Leadership Program, I'm running it with my colleague Chris Kisley. Um, she's like um, she's Atlanta's answer to Brené Brown. Um, just one of the most human centric, uh, empathetic people I've ever come across and worked with. The way Chris understands humans is just absolutely mind-blowingly incredible. I'm very privileged to work with her. Um, so we start on the 21st of June, um, head to Eventbrite and uh, use the 10% off code webinar. I would love to see you there. Um, and uh, Anna Marie that I work for Chris, can confirm everything Graham is saying right now. Yeah, um, Chris is amazing and uh, couldn't be here today, but um, we're very uh, excited about starting on the 21st of June. Um, feel free to sign up today and join us while there are still some tickets. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to hang out, um, just stay on the line right now. We're going to uh, I'm going to carry on going through questions. I haven't been through any of the stuff that's in the chat yet, so I'm going to go back through in a second. Um, but if you're leaving us here um, just at the end of the former part of the, the webinar, then thank you for being here. Um, thank you for making some space to think about kindness and kindful leadership. Um, that really just kind of warms my heart that you have done that. And um, I hope you carry this through into the rest of your day. That idea of cafe sospeso, um, how can you create those vessels where other people then uh, find it much easier to be kind? And also my little email challenge. What can you do on email today that is kind? Thank you so much for being here.